Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Stan Simonton, pastor of Katy Community Church. Glad you could be with us today. We're continuing our study on our spiritual assets. Today, we're going to study the doctrine of reconciliation. Before we begin, let's stop and pause for a moment of silent prayer, which gives us each the opportunity to examine ourselves and to make sure that we are in fellowship with God by using what we call the rebound technique, which is based on 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is truly our privilege. We thank you for the opportunity that we enjoy to be able to come together in freedom and study your word together. Pray you'll help each one of us today with our understanding and application of this great doctrine of reconciliation so that we may continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Reconciliation. There are two words in the Greek language for reconciliation. One is dialosko, it's D-I-A-L-L-O-S-S-O, -S -S and it means to reconcile two parties that are mutually hostile toward one another. The second word is katalosto, K-A-T-A-L-L-O-S-S-O, -S -S and it means to reconcile two parties where only one party is hostile toward the other. So the doctrine of reconciliation or reconciliation of God uses the second word, kata lasso. This means that it is man who is hostile to God and has become rebellious by means of his inherent sin nature. This means that mankind is actually the enemy of God, and that is that it's man who needs to be reconciled to God. God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. Literally, that word means to change or exchange. Originally, of course, it talked, it, it referred to money, but it came to mean a change from being one's enemy to being one's friend. And this is the meaning throughout the New Testament. At the moment of salvation, the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, believing that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin, you are reconciled to God. It happens instantaneously. This means that believers are no longer God's enemies but that peace has been made as a result of a change of mind toward Christ, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 10. A change of mind in Scripture is the definition of the word repentance, metanoneo in the Greek language. It does not mean to feel sorry for or to change your behavior or stop uh, sinning, or feel sorry for your sin. None of those things have anything whatsoever to do with salvation. A change of mind is what the word repentance means. What are you changing your mind about? You're changing your mind about Jesus Christ. When you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you automatically change your mind from not believing to believing. That's what the word repentance means. Now, what are the mechanics of reconciliation? How does it take place? What's it all about? What does it truly mean for a person who believes in Christ as their Savior? Well, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, which we'll read in a few minutes, give us that answer. But before we go there and read that, let me say that reconciliation is accomplished 
what it accomplishes is the removal of a barrier. As I told you, before you are reconciled to God, you are God's enemy. So reconciliation removes that. It removes the barrier that exists between God and man. And once this barrier is removed, the possibility exists for peace between God and man. The barrier that separates God from man is sin. At the moment that you were born, you inherited a sin nature was passed down to you genetically from your father. But you also received Adam's original sin. That's what was imputed to you at birth. And it's Adam's original sin that condemns us. Personal sins are committed because man possesses a sin nature. You don't receive a sin nature because you commit personal sin. Personal sin is committed because you have a sin nature. And every human being has one. And by the way, just a little side note, you don't lose that sin nature the moment you believe in Christ as your Savior. The Bible is very clear about this, that the moment you trust Christ as your personal Savior, a spiritual battle begins to see who is going to control your soul, whether you're going to allow God to do it or whether you're going to allow your sin nature to do it. Since God can have nothing to do with sin, the sin barrier must be removed. In order for a person to have a relationship with God. We're talking about the spiritual mechanics that accomplish this for man. We have to understand that Jesus Christ is our sin bearer. It's a concept actually that comes from the Old Testament called the kinsman redeemer. If you've ever read the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth is all about the kinsman redeemer. A man named Boaz, who was a distant kin to Naomi, who was Ruth's mother-in-law, he was legally able to purchase Ruth from slavery or slavery or servitude. So that concept came down to mean to us that Jesus Christ is our redeemer. He's our kinsman redeemer. He's kin to us because he's humanity. The other two requirements for the kinsman redeemer is they had to have the purchase price, which Christ did. He purchased us with his own death on the cross. The other thing that had to be is that he had to be willing to do it. And Christ was a willing sacrifice for our sins. So, so the judgment of our sins was satisfied when Christ died on the cross when God poured out the sins of the entire human race, past, present, and future, upon Jesus Christ and judged them. God accepts Jesus Christ as a sin bearer, which means that mankind, the moment that they believe, are reconciled to God. That's how you accept the payment. It's non-meritorious. It's just a matter of faith, just believing what Christ did for you. It's not a matter of your good works or your church membership or your faithfulness to God before or after salvation it has nothing to do with you being reconciled to God. You're reconciled to God because of what Christ did for you. And when you believe that, God applies that to you, and you are reconciled to God. So it also means we're no longer enemies of God, but peace. That's what reconciliation brings. It brings peace between us and God, or what we like to say, peace with God. And since God is not a respecter of persons, anyone, 
that believes in Christ as Savior can be reconciled to God. It's based on your free will. You make the choice. God doesn't coerce you into a, any type of decision. He tries to influence you. The Holy Spirit, one of his ministries, is trying to influence us to believe in Jesus Christ, but we are never forced to believe. So when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, he's writing to every one of us in the church age who personally believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior and become part of the body of Christ. Generally speaking, the Jews, who Paul was a Jew, by the way, the Jews believed in one God and they were very moral people. The Gentiles, on the other hand, other hand believed in many gods and they were very immoral, generally speaking. Paul shows us that there's no distinction in, within the body of Christ. There's no racial distinction, there's no social distinction, there's no gender distinction. Why? Because we've been reconciled to God, all of us, regardless of who you are, what your gender is, what your social status is, what your race is, has nothing whatsoever to do with being reconciled to God. Anyone, I don't care who you are, you can be reconciled to God by a simple act of faith in what Christ did for you on the cross when he died and paid for your sins. So let's read Ephesians chapter 2, see how Paul puts it. Here's how it begins in verse 14. Jesus Christ has reconciled both Jew and Gentile believers to God, having destroyed the barrier that separated them from God and canceled the effects of the Mosaic Law. What were the effects of the Mosaic Law? They showed the Jew that they were sinners in need of a Savior. The Mosaic Law was never designed for salvation. Salvation has always been and always will be faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Let's read on. Thus making in himself, Jesus Christ, a new spiritual species, a new creation from both Jews and Gentiles, which results in the reconciliation with God. We're all one body in Christ regardless of who you are. He did this so that we might change our relationship with God, resulting in the formation of the body of Christ. This is accomplished by Jesus Christ's work on the cross in putting to death the discord that previously existed, the barrier, the discord between God and man. He came and he preached the gospel of reconciliation to both the Gentile and the Jew. It is through Jesus Christ, under the filling of the Holy Spirit, that we have access to God the Father. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Kind of a corrected translation or a doctrinal translation, if you will. So you can see from Paul's writing that reconciliation means that God is being, excuse me, man is being reconciled to God, not God being reconciled to man. The cross is the point of reconciliation. This means that Jesus Christ literally took our place on the cross. He became our substitute accomplishing for us something that we could not accomplish for ourselves. And what was that? Reconciliation to God. The peace that we need in order to be able to go to heaven and live forever is to have peace with God. 
That's what reconciliation is. It's making peace with God. And only Christ's spiritual death on the cross, where he was being judged for the sins of the entire human race, could satisfy the righteousness and justice of God. Therefore, the spiritual death of Christ on the cross is the instrument, if you will, the mechanic of re reconciliation. That's how it comes into being, is through what Christ did for us when he was judged for the sins of the entire human race. Man's good works fall well short of God's righteousness, according to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. But in Christ, believers possess divine righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may, might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you are placed into union with him. So you are said to be in Christ. And in Christ, you possess the righteousness of God. And it was God who took this initiative, not man. God took the initiative, laid out a plan of salvation for the human race, and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to accomplish it for us. And when man takes the initiative in an attempt to, to reconcile himself to God through his good deeds or good works, it results in some form of religion, because that's what religion is always about. It's always based on human effort. When God took the initiative, he sent his son to die as the payment for all sin, which is grace, not works. And grace, by the way, is mutually exclusive of human works. So what are the results of reconciliation? Well, we know about them because Paul writes about them in the book of Colossians. I'm getting my Bible. I want to read this to you. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul is writing to a church in Colossae, and he's writing about reconciliation. Let me just read these verses for you. Let's begin in uh, verse 21. He says, Although and although you were pre previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, he's talking about toward God, Yet he, Christ, has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death, through his death on the cross, in order to, pre to present you before him holy and blameless. That's reconciliation. And beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly, established and steadfast and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now, you're not talking about losing your salvation here, okay? You have to understand this. He's writing to a group of Christians, and he's explaining to them that they were hostile toward God. They were God's enemies. And they were reconciled to God through what Christ did for them on the cross. Now, as believers in Jesus Christ, God wants us to be presented holy and blameless when we stand before Jesus Christ. That's what these verses say. When, when in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That's talking about your Christian life. So reconciliation has not only ramifications for eternity, it also have ram has ramifications for our daily living. 
it takes place simultaneously at salvation with all the other spiritual assets that we receive. The results cannot be felt. They can't be seen. It takes place spiritually. Verse 21 that we just read says that we were aliens and enemies in our minds. The word also means adversary and used of Satan, actually. So that was our status before salvation. And that word aliens means to be estranged from. This means that prior to salvation, we were estranged from and the enemies of God. And since this hatred in the mind is in our thinking, that needs to be transformed before and after salvation. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And don't be conformed to this world system. So for believers in Christ, peace, exi peace exists between that person, that believer, and God. And they are no longer estranged from God. In verse 23 that we just read in Colossians 1, tells us it's not talking about our position in Christ, but it's talking about our experience on a daily basis. We call it experiential sanctification. Sanctification just means being set apart. In the case of believers, it's set apart to God. Verse 23 of Colossians chapter 1 is the verse that we read earlier. And it says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. So we know it's not talking about salvation. The salvation has nothing to do with your good works before or after salvation. So it's talking about our experience. It's experiential truth, not positional truth. That if clause tells us that it is only potential. Maybe you will. And maybe you won't be presented blameless. The only way you're going to be presented blameless is if you execute God's plan, purpose, and will for your life. So the other, only other result of reconciliation is that the believer is qualified to receive a resurrection body. So you have two aspects. You have positional truth and you have experiential truth. The positional truth is that you're part of the body of Christ. You've been reconciled to God. The second part of reconciliation, the potential now exists for you and for me as believers to live our spiritual lives. And when we stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of what we did, as believers, while we were here on this earth, which we all will do, it's called the judgment seat of Christ. Then and only then can we be presented blameless and without reproach if we fulfilled our responsibility as believers to live our spiritual lives. Those who fail to do that will suffer shame if not for a moment so even though reconciliation takes place while we're in this body we will be presented to Christ and will be in resurrection body so believers now have the potential of being presented blameless but it's only potential that word blameless means with nothing laid to one's charge after public investigation. So you can see it's talking about 
how we are going to be evaluated when we stand before Jesus Christ. Now, believe me, it's not talking about salvation because you're not, if you're an unbeliever, you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you won't be at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll be at another judgment called the Great White Throne Judgment, where you'll be judged according to your works. And your works do not rise to the level of God's righteousness, which you need in order to go to heaven and have eternal life. So at the great white throne judgment, unbelievers will be shown that all their good works, all their good deeds were not enough for them to have eternal life. There's only one way to have eternal life, and that's faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, what he did for you on the cross. So the Greek word, when it says grounded, we are to be grounded, spiritually speaking. It's talking about a foundation or being founded, being stable. The word for continue in the faith means to remain on, keep on doing what you're doing living your spiritual life, applying your faith. We call it the faith rest technique, where we claim the promises of God. In other words, you will be presented with nothing laid to your account if you remain on track by building a foundation of accurate doctrinal truth in your mind and not sliding into a state of what we call reversionism. Some people call it backsliding. Both terms mean that you have abandoned your spiritual life and you won't be presented blameless before Jesus Christ if that's the case. So believers are not only reconciled to God at salvation, but believers also become God's ambassadors of reconciliation to the world in which we live. The Bible says that we are given the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. What's that mean? This means that it is our responsibility to openly and boldly with our mouths share the gospel with others and at the same time have a Christ-like character that authenticates the message we are sharing. If your lifestyle is such that you are not representing Jesus Christ properly, then when you speak the gospel, if you do, people have a tendency not to believe what you're telling them because your life doesn't back up what you are saying. What is it, a, the phrase about walking the talk or something of that nature? Well, as Christians, we need to walk the talk. And we need to talk the walk. In other words, we need to open our mouths and talk about Jesus Christ and share the good news of the gospel with other people. Failure to do that means we are not properly representing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, I'm not talking about being a religious nut and running around and getting in people's face and talking about Jesus. I'm talking about having a relationship with a person such that you can sit down with them in a loving, kind way and share the good news of the gospel and what Christ has done for them. And one good way to do that is sharing what Christ has done for you. Your personal testimony is a good way to share the gospel. But we must always be clear when we're sharing the gospel. And the clarity of the gospel is that a simple act of faith in what Christ did for you and for me on the cross when he paid the penalty for our sins. A simple decision, an act of faith will get you, you will receive eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9. 
or by grace. Grace is a word that means undeserved and unmerited. You can't earn it. You can't. You don't merit it. None of us do. That's what grace means. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved. Not For by grace you're saved through faith. Faith is just believing. For by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's nothing that you can do to earn it or deserve it. It's a gift of God, the verse goes on to say, not of works. So salvation is just a matter of believing what Christ did for you. It's that simple. Don't make it difficult. So this ministry that we have called the Ministry of Reconciliation and the Word of Reconciliation is how God communicates this message of salvation to the rest of the world. It's therefore imperative that we learn how to share the gospel with others clearly and effectively. It is not our job, by the way, to coerce people into making a decision for Christ, quote unquote, whatever that means to a person. Our job is to simply explain the gospel clearly. Once we do that, the Holy Spirit will make it understandable to the person who is positive and wants to know truth. But it is our job. Let's be very clear about that. It is our job to be witnesses for Christ. And whether you like it or not, if people know you're a Christian, you are a witness. And you may be a poor witness. Hopefully you're not. Hopefully you're a great witness for Jesus Christ. And people can see Christ in your life, in your attitudes, in your actions, in your words. And because of that testimony, it will give you the opportunity to share the good news with other people. That's what reconciliation is all about. You've been reconciled to God. You know other people want to be reconciled to God. They just haven't heard a clear gospel message. They think that Christianity is all about a bunch of good do-gooders. Do and in reality, the Christians are those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not religion. It's a relationship. And the only way to have that relationship is taking step one, and that's believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope you've done that. If not, do it right now. Just a simple, simply say to God, if you want to verbalize it, that you're believing in Christ. But he knows. The moment you believe in Christ, he knows. You don't have to verbalize it. You don't have to walk down an aisle. You don't have to tell anybody about it. It's a personal decision that you make, and it's between you and God. Now, once you come to know Christ as your Savior, you're probably going to want to share that with that good news with other people. That would be a natural thing to do. That has nothing to do with your salvation. Only faith, faith alone. Thanks for joining us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that upon our faith in Christ, we were reconciled to you. Peace has been made. We have peace with God. Now help us as believers in Jesus Christ to represent you before the world and take our responsibility of the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation, seriously and realize that we have a, an obligation, a responsibility before you to share this good news with other people. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to do so. Pray that you'll lead us to people who are hungry for the word, who want to know Christ as their Savior, who want to know you so that we can share this good news with them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.